Thank you for downloading this episode of a History of Central Florida podcast. This is the podcast where we explore Central Florida's history through the artifacts found in local area museums and historical societies. This series is brought to you by Riches, the regional initiative to collect the histories, experiences, and stories of Central Florida, and the Orange County Regional History Center. I am Chip Ford, and I will be your host for today's episode titled Wendover Burial Site. This podcast, the first of the series, is about the end, specifically death. Although we all might harbor passionate emotions about death, especially those of our loved ones and ourselves, for a group of researchers, death can be a window into life. This podcast will feature objects that were recovered from the Windover site in Brevard County. The Windover site was a burial ground used over 7,000 years ago during Florida's archaic period. Not a lot is known about the people who lived and were buried there. The Windover site tells us a great deal about the past, especially in terms of the changing environment. During the archaic period, sea levels were rising due to the ending of the Ice Age and this created more estuaries in the region that would become Florida. As such, the land could support more diverse life than in previous periods. You may find it unusual that researchers would use death, and especially the preparation for death, as a means to understand a civilization and society. But Rachel Wentz with the Florida Public Archaeology Network tells us why mortuary analysis might be a unique way to understand a people. About 80% of the information we get from the archaeological record actually comes from cemeteries. And there's a whole field of archaeology called mortuary analysis that examines the way people inter the dead. The ritual that is used, um, this incorporates body position, artifact assemblages in the form of burial goods, um, how the body is treated, how it is placed in the ground, any aspect of that makes up that burial process tells us something about the societies. They're all symbolic. They all have some sort of ritual meaning. If you think in terms of modern burials, you know, they're typically in America, fancy casket, extended body, hands over the chest. You know, the person is typically dressed in their finery. All of that is to kind of exude the wealth and status of the individual. Well, we see that same kind of practice in ancient cultures in the form of grave goods and body treatments. All of that makes a statement about who that person was in life. So mortuary analysis takes all of that information into account. We have to ask ourselves, what can the Windover site tell us today about the people who lived thousands of years ago? Since there are no surviving documents or records, we can only speculate as to their history. Dr. Gerald Milanich, emeritus professor at the University of Florida, offered us one theory as to why the archaic peoples of Florida took such great care to commemorate their dead. The local people that uh, camped around that Windover Pond uh, more than 6,000 years ago used the the muck in the bottom of the pond as a place to bury their dead. And it looks like they would return there over literally generations, perhaps hundreds of years, and uh, wrap the bodies of their relatives in matting or uh, cloth made from vegetable fibers and inter them in the pond, in the muck. It it was, again, perhaps a way to put people in a, a setting that would keep their spirits from coming back to bother the living people. Dr. Milanich gives us a broad window to understand the role of burial to the Windover site and how these preparations might have constructed a belief system concerning death in the afterlife. What can these remains tell us about how the archaic Indians constructed their lives and their day-to-day social patterns? Dr. Glenn Duran from Florida State University tells us how Windover can help us answer this question. 
when we when we look at particularly cemetery data, and there's some other kinds of data that we can use for this too, but when we look at the cemetery data and we look at, at where and what materials are buried with, with males, with females, with subadults, it gives us, again, a window on some, in this case, modest status and position differences uh, most of the males had um, animal bone uh, dental material, for example. So there's, there's, there are different categories, and we, we did a fairly detailed analysis of, you know, who had what and how much did they have. You know, and, and compared to later populations, certainly, these differences are, are pretty modest, but we can, in fact, pick up some of those differences between males and females. Researchers believe that since so many tools and objects were found buried with the dead, they believe the archaic Indians in this region were relatively prosperous since the surplus of tools and other technology could be easily discarded. Scholars also conclude that there was a sex differentiation in this group of people since adult men were buried with specific stone tools and hunting instruments. However, a large wooden pestle, an object associated with grinding grains and other food products, was found alongside the body of a four-year-old child. Scholars are unclear as to what this might mean. Dr. Duran reminds us that these objects tell a variety of stories, not only how societies organize themselves, but also their scientific and technological achievements. Well, one of the things the excellent preservation of wet sites offers you is, is this incredible inventory of materials that, that really do reflect uh, you know, the, in this case, the prehistoric technology of the times. But it's the organics that really, the, the bone, the antler, the wood, the hand-woven textiles, all of these kinds of things really make up about 95 to 98 percent of, of most society's stuff, so to speak. So we get this picture that is, is seldom revealed in any other way outside of these, these really wet sites with excellent preservation. But it, it gives you information on the manufacturing technique. It shows you the steps in manufacture. It shows you, in some cases, the use activities with those things. And it's, it's, it really is a totally different picture of, of prehistoric society. What probably was the most insightful and most frustrating find for the researchers at Windover were the fragile textiles. Textiles were found in the form of clothing, cords, bags, and other objects that were woven to drape or carry items. How these items were woven and manufactured gave researchers a fascinating window into the evolution of textile manufacturing over thousands of years. Dr. Duran explains. One of the things that, that is, I think, fascinating about Wendover is the fact that over 60 burials were interred with different kinds of hand-woven fabric, from bags to sort of capes to tunic-like materials. There's some string. Uh, and what is remarkable about the fabrics is that they are surprisingly complex. And a lot of archaeologists and people, when they think about you know, what amounts to fairly deep prehistory, you know, seven, 8,000 years ago, you have this, this image of, of hide-clad hunters and gatherers. But in fact, you know, this is an incredibly rich textile industry. It's something that, that simply vanishes in most cases. I mean, it's a really old technology. And it's, it's interesting because the, uh, when you talk to the, the experts who've done the analysis for us, it's actually very, very complex. And if you compare the windover fabric technologies in terms of the weaving patterns to what we know that's, say, 5,000 years later, it's actually more complex in this early period than it is closer to contact. So there's, there's some changes that have taken place that, that may reflect, you know, a simplification of the, the technology. In a way, some of this complexity is, I guess you could call it a lost art that was refined down to you know, simpler elements closer to the time of contact. As Dr. Duran mentioned, the textile production was extremely complex for the time. Researchers have identified five styles of weaving of varying complexity that made up these textile objects, many of which scholars conclude were created specifically for the burial ceremony.
all of the textiles were created on a fixed frame and handcrafted. The textiles were made from cabbage palmetto fibers and wraps were made from grass of unknown origin. These textiles were distributed between the sexes and ages, so researchers believe that archaic Indians incorporated these objects specifically into their cemetery practices. Textiles were not the only objects whose decorations and ornamentation tell us about the lives of the Wendover peoples. Dr. Duran spoke to us about the decorations found on tools. There's really quite an elaborate decorative pattern on those things, and it's you know, we often think of, of folks making these kinds of tools, bone, antler, whatever, without sort of a, shall we say, an artistic eye. But the reality is, if you look at the organics from these kinds of wet sites, you realize that, you know, we're just like them. We tend to decorate things, and it's those decorative patterns and styles that that really provide us you know, a hint of a of a much richer let's say, symbolic and, uh, you know, and, a, and a decorative pattern in, in, in this particular point in time. Since wood objects were far more common than stone tools at Windover, researchers conclude that wood was the primary source for tools used by the archaic Indians. Tools made from wood, bone, teeth, and antlers were crafted by artisans in a variety of ways to change their shape, to include holes or crevices, as well as just craft a decorative pattern. To an early archaic society such as the one found at Windover, tools would have been valuable to their survival. Thus, their inclusion in the burial site tells us that a great amount of care went into these preparations. Examining these people and their civilization, it is natural to feel a bit frustrated by the fact that we don't know who they were or what they called themselves. They are left for us today as merely the impersonal terms we use, such as archaic Indians or Wendover burial site. Dr. Milanich reminds us that while their names may have been lost, these people and their descendants would populate the region for thousands of years. Well, we don't know what the people called themselves or what their names were once we get you know, back into the pre-Columbian period before Europeans show up. So we have to give names to things, we, to cultures. Uh, we talk about archaic period cultures, and so the, the Windover population, the Windover people, are archaic Florida Indians, and quite likely their descendants become the people of what we call the St. John's culture, named, of course, for the St. John's River. You can pretty much trace people living in East Florida from the archaic period well up into the uh, 17th and, and early 18th century. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of A History of Central Florida podcast. For more information about Windover and to see a replica exhibit of the objects we discussed in this podcast, visit the Brevard Museum of History and Natural Science at 2201 Michigan Avenue, Cocoa, Florida, 32926. Make sure to join us for our next episode titled Ceramic Pots. (music) 